We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. My name's John. I am one of the executive pastors here at ACC. And I got to tell you, I have been really excited about this message. Uh, today, I've been thinking and praying and researching about this for weeks, even, even longer. But, um, you know, about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity and the honor of leading a Go Adventure um, with a bunch of youth. And we went to Providence, Rhode Island, and we were able to do some VBS work. We were able to work with the homeless. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the future, in a few weeks. But I just want you to know, listen, they did a phenomenal job. Um, seriously, I can't underscore enough. And you know what? As we go into Kid Point, um, how many of you guys have ever been to Outback Steakhouse? How many? Okay, you are already pre-qualified for helping in Kid Point. Okay, another shrimp on the bobby or whatever. And, and I will have a bad accent as well, but we will get through that together and it'll be fun. It'll be a lot of fun and we'll make fun of each other and our accents, okay? Um, it is one that comes into a season that's been a little tumultuous at best. Um, we're going to be talking about when does life begin, Okay, and let me tell you, this is one that, listen, you want to hear the whole message, so whether you are joining us in person or online, we want you to know we're glad that you've gathered with us. If this is your first time here, we are so glad and honored that you have joined us today. Can we give a, just a thank you? Yeah. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we're going to get into God's word, but let's first begin with a word of prayer. God Almighty, we come before you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for how you purpose in our lives to do good, that you work in our hearts and in our minds. And we thank you that you've sent your son, Jesus, to pour out your amazing grace, to let his triumph on the cross be the, the final tune, the final uh, note in our story. Lord, we ask for your amazing grace. I ask for your amazing grace this morning, Lord. I ask you, Father, I need it just as much today, even more maybe today than the first day that I came to know it. Lord, I ask that you would help me to speak clearly and boldly the truth of your word. We ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So as we talk about when does life begin, understand, when somebody's asking this question, there's a lot of things that are going on. There's a lot of stories, and, and you've probably heard a story as well, but I think about stories along the lines of, you know, what happens when, you know, a, a mother becomes pregnant and finds out, man, we got like five babies coming along. Like, what's this going to look like? And people begin to ask questions about that. Or it might be, you know what, you become pregnant. The one, you know, the, the mother becomes pregnant, and she finds out, hey, listen, things aren't going the way that they're supposed to. I don't know what's going to happen with this baby. Maybe, maybe something's just not going quite as planned biologically. Or maybe, maybe you've had a friend like I have where they're 18 years old and they're pregnant and they're not married and they're afraid and their parents are afraid and there's just so much going on. And so when we ask this question, when does life begin? Understand, it is a very important question. But for many, it may be a very loaded question with a lot of emotion. So this morning, you know, if somebody were to ask me, when does life begin? I'm asking for a friend. I would say, first and foremost, I want to ask, are, are they a follower of Jesus or not? Are they a believer or a non-believer? Where, where are they in that? Because I'm going to begin that conversation a little bit differently. And so this morning, if, if you're here and, and you're sitting here going, man, I just, I just came in here and I'm just trying to figure out about Jesus, know that this is a safe place to ask questions, okay? And if you have questions at the end of this service, I would love to talk with you. We have people here who would love to talk with you. But, you know, for me, for the person who says, 
you know, um, they're, they're not a believer or, or they really don't know a lot about the Bible, um, then I would say, okay, well then we're going to start out with this outside of the scriptures, okay? And the reason I would say that is the same reason that Paul, an earlier follower of Jesus, it's reported that in the book of Acts, that when he went to Athens, Athens, Greece, when he went there, he looked around. And as he looked around, he said, man, I can see that you guys are very religious people. They were all into philosophy, new ideas, and everything else. But as far as the truth of the scriptures, this had no place in their life yet. And so he began by speaking of things that they knew of philosophers and philosophies and went from there. And so for us, I, for me, if I was talking with somebody who, who was not speaking or did not know the scriptures, I'd say, let's look at a little bit of science first. This is one of those moments where, you know, uh, I don't think that science and faith have to be against each other. I think that the further that you get into science, the further that you get to understanding nature, it should reveal God that much more and his purposes in our life as well. So I want to I wanna lay a few truth bombs on you, okay? So, so basically, at the very beginning, you've got, uh, this is just, you remember basic biology back in, in high school, middle school, all this stuff, okay? You've got the sperm and you've got the egg, and then they come together, and there's conception, okay? And at that point, things begin to happen. The first thing that we see is at about 18 to 24 days, the heart, it begins to beat. That's right, as early as 18 to 24 days, there's a heart, and it's beating. At, at day 45, around 45 days, the brain waves are present. Now, I understand, for some of you guys, you have teenagers, and you're like, I'm not so certain about that, John. I'm not so certain about that. I want you to know the brain waves will return eventually when they move out. <laughs> but also at day four, around 45 days, the mother, the mama can feel physical movement, you know? Around day 45, right around there, that's where the soccer match begins, okay? And you mamas, you know all about this. You're like, oh, don't even tell me. They're, 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 they are, there are definitely some penalties going on. At eight weeks, the baby possesses the unique fingerprints that they will have for an entire lifetime. Day 45, it's that early. At eight weeks, at eight weeks, we see, we see those, those fingerprints. At eight weeks, we also see all bodily functions. That is, all the organs are present. And only a few weeks later, at week 11, they're all fully functional and working. And just all these things are going on. At two months, in fact, it's not up on here, but at two months, that baby, their, their neurosystem is so fully formed that they feel everything. They are feeling things, okay? It, it, just like when you stub your toe, guess what? They're hurting at times. And here's the thing. In the midst of it, at 11 to 12 weeks, a baby, a baby can suck their thumb, okay? A baby can suck their thumb and... It is an amazing thing to watch these things. But here's the thing. When I talk about all of this, I need, to, I need to even, it's not even on this chart, but I want you to hear very clearly. From that, that day of conception, there is a DNA blueprint from the very beginning. And it, and it tells, it says, this is how we're going to construct this. And as much as when you build a house, contractors don't just go out, although it might feel like it, they don't just go out and start building things. They actually have a blueprint. They know what this is supposed to look like from the very beginning as they construct everything in it. And the same thing happens with the body. The end is declared from the beginning in many ways. Now, can there th be things that happen along the way? Yes, there can be. But here's the thing. There is a DNA structure that every single one of us begins with. But you know, when we talk about this, it's a highly emotional, it's a highly emotional conversation too. And sometimes I think that we need to bring in some things from outside to really understand this, okay? And I remember, listen, when my babies, when my kids, they're, I've got a college age, I've got a high schooler, I've got a middle schooler, and let me tell you, there is a moment that every parent looks forward to. It's this sound that they look forward to. That's that heartbeat. Now let me tell you, and when you hear that heartbeat, you're like, that's my baby. That's my baby. In fact, even before that or around that time, what do we start doing? Listen, we love to take pictures in this society, don't we? 
And so we take pictures like this. Wow, look at that baby. And we begin to refer to it as our, like a little peanut, right? Little peanut. Or, you know, around that time, we might have even bigger pictures like this. Go ahead. We've got it where, you know, in the past, that's all that you had. You had just a black and white picture, and that was it. But today, you've got 4D pictures. I mean, come on, you've got 4K televisions in your home. Why should we not have 4D images, right? And if I were to actually animate this, it would be moving all over the place. The baby would be moving. But here's the thing. When you do this, when you see these images, now some of you guys, I know that you guys like surprises. I also know that a lot of you guys like to open up your Christmas presents before Christmas, don't you? Yeah, me too. And so what do you do in the midst of this? We want to know what's the, what's the gender. We want to know that. And so what do we do to celebrate that? We do gender reveal, and we find out, what, what is this? Is it, is it a boy? Is it, is it a girl? It is a boy! And this little boy is actually up in Kid Point right now. And is, that's right. It's, it's, uh, it's Noah Duffy, and uh, his mama is taking care of the slides right now, and wow, is that stuff going everywhere. I wondered about that the other day. <laughs> Woo! But here's the thing. When we look at all these things, and I breathe all of this, <laughs> as we look at all these, it's an interesting thing, because we are ta- we've been talking about life. And as we talk about life, in order to understand what life is, sometimes we also have to look at, what does death look like? What's the opposite? According to Harvard Medical School, the criteria for A person being dead, I know, sometimes we need this, right? For a moment, just nudge the person next to you. Make sure that they're awake, okay? The criteria for a person being dead is, first, no response to external stimuli or pain. The second, no spontaneous movements or respiratory efforts. The third one, no deep reflexes. And the fourth one, no brain activity indicated by an EEG. Now, using these observations of science, if the reverse of even one, even one of these criteria occurred, the fetus would be considered alive. If one of these is there, that person is considered alive. It's not even a matter of consciousness because we would say that a person who's in a coma for five years we would say that there's life there still, that there's something there. It's interesting because there's a, uh, I want to read a quote from an atheist by the name of Elizabeth Cornwell. She's the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. And if if you know anything about Richard Dawkins, he is all about atheism. This is a person who does not believe in God in any way, shape, or form. But she says this, there's a war on the womb. As a secular pro-lifer, I believe my case is scientifically and philosophically sound. Science concedes that human life begins at fertilization and it follows that abortion is ageism and discrimination against our own species. Wow! Talk about a truth bomb. Now remember, I'm speaking to your friend who does not necessarily believe. And I'm speaking from information from people who... They're not looking at the scriptures. They're just saying, here's the information. Here's what it is. And so when we ask that question of when does life begin, we hear from the secular pro-lifer, the atheist, says it begins at fertilization. That is at conception. From the moment that that DNA structure changes, because that DNA, it's not the same as mama's. It's not the same as their daddy's. It's their own unique. In fact, it's an amazing thing because they may even have a different blood type than mom. They are their own person. And you might say, man, John, you are getting really political, really political. Because right now it is very political, but I want you to hear very clearly, especially within the church, it's not a political issue. It's a moral issue. It's a moral issue. 65% of all women who have abortions self-identify as believers in Christ, as Christians. So this is very much an in-house conversation because, you know, I've talked with friends as everything's been going around the country. 
And it's amazing to find how many pastors and youth pastors and ministers in general are struggling to stand for the truth. Many, I understand it. It's like, I just want to talk about Jesus. Listen, me too. But listen, if we don't talk about when life begins, who will? If we don't teach our children when life begins, who will? I love what C.S. Lewis says when talking about science. He says, in science, we have been reading only the note to a poem. In Christianity, we find the poem itself. And what a beautiful poem it is. So what does the Bible say about when life begins? God affirms life and value by virtue of being made in his image. And this morning, I want to share three ways that we determine value. And this is actually out of a book which is well worth reading. It's Culture Shock, a biblical response to today's most divisive issues. It's by Chip Ingram, and I just love, I love his, his stuff. But here's the thing. The first way that we determine value is value is determined by creation and design. Think about this. If you built something, how much would you value it? Think about like when, when, if you have kids or when you were a kid and at school, you know, you made that, that, that macaroni necklace and you gave it to mom at Mother's Day and they're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing, this is beautiful and inside you're like, yeah, that's better than dad's gold necklace. We give value. We give value by creation and design and, and here's the thing. It matters who has made it, and if you are the one who has made it, you attribute even greater value. You will always value your home more if you built it than if somebody else did even. It says in Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And so we have value simply because God has created us because God has made us and made us in his image. The second way that we determine value, value is determined by protection. Think about this, okay? Think about your, your car, your home, your phone. Right now, your phone right now most likely has a password to it. If I went out into the parking lot and I went to your car, you probably locked it up. If I went to your home right now, it's probably locked up. Why? Because we attribute worth to these things. We consider value to these things. And how much more if it's your family, your kids, your parents, your friends? We attribute value and we determine it by the way that we protect it. And God is no different as we read in Genesis 9, 6. It says in Genesis, whoever sheds human blood... By humans shall their blood be shed, for the image of God has God made mankind. Now, let me give you a little bit of background within this. At this point in Genesis, the flood has come. Violence had, had, had come up in the earth. There was so much violence against humanity, against each other, that God finally was like, I got to put an end to this. I got to stop the insanity. And so he says, I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to cover the earth, and I'm going to start out with a new Adam, Noah. And as the waters recede, he again indicates, you have been made in my image, and I want to protect you. And so he, as it were, gives a law here because there were those who had been violent, and he's trying to put an end to it. And if within it, that's not even clear. You can go straight to the Ten Commandments. I know sometimes it's like, well, can, I, can we just make it really simple? Here it is. Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. He makes it really simple there. But when we talk about the Bible, and as I've done this research, and as I've been praying and meditating on God's word, and even outside looking at science and such, I got to tell you, there is a ton here. There is just simply a ton. In fact, I've got a, a, there's a second book that I have over here. It's uh, by Randy Alcorn. It says, Pro-Life Answers to Pro-Choice Arguments. Look at how thick that thing is. I read, other, I read another book that was on early church history and, and how the church answered these questions because quite honestly, this, this tumultuous situation that we find ourselves in, this, these questions, these are not new questions. 
These have been going on for a very long time, even back to uh, uh, biblical times, even, even to, you can go to Plato's Republic and it's written about in, in Greece. This is, goes back a long time. And so one of the things that we've decided to do as a church as I've talked with Pastor Matt, uh, he's on sabbatical right now, and he's out in California, and I am hoping and praying that he is getting a well-deserved time of rest, relaxation, and connected with his family. As He hasn't been back home to California in years. But here's the thing. When he gets back, um, in the next, he's not going to do it in the next two weeks, but he'll be back in about a week or so. And here's the thing. This fall, we're going to be doing what's called Elephant Room. And he's going to be going through elephant room, and he's going to take two and a half, three hours, and he's just going to lay out, here's what the scriptures say. Here's what science says. And if you have questions at that time, he is going to try to come alongside people as well, because this is a very important question that many of our friends are asking, and maybe you may be asking as well. But I wanted to take one particular section of scripture that oftentimes is used to say, listen, um, God's law doesn't even go there. Now, we are under grace, okay, by Jesus' blood on the cross, but here's the thing. The law tells us a great deal. It tells us a lot about where God is coming from and what his thoughts are. And so I want to read out of the New Revised Standard Version. Now, and when I read this, understand, there's some translation stuff going on here. And so we're going to go into this a little bit deeper. It's in Exodus 21, 22 through 25. So let me read this to you. It says in the NRSV, it says, When people who are fighting injure a pregnant woman so that there is a miscarriage and yet no further harm follows, the one responsible shall be fined what the woman's husband demands pain as much as the judges determine. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Man, that is intense, isn't it? But when you read this, the story sounds a lot like this. There were a couple dudes. Maybe, maybe it was a couple ladies, but I, I, I want to think dudes, okay? Because dudes tend to fight a little bit more. So there's a little bit of fight club going on here. I don't know what she's doing there. Maybe she's trying to separate or whatever. But in the midst of it, there's, there, something happens. And her baby, it doesn't say how old. Might be a couple months. Might be three months, might be eight months, don't know. But in the midst of this fight, she gets hit, she gets hurt. And according to this translation, it says there's a miscarriage. And if she's injured, then there's ramifications. But if it's just the baby, not a big deal. Glossing over that, I realize. But here's the thing. This word over here that we see as miscarriage, it's actually mistranslated. And oftentimes when you are reading something like this and, or people are even bringing it up, I want to encourage you, go find three or four different translations. You may not know Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, but what you can do is you can look at multiple translations. And when you do that, most likely, if they all sound the same, they're pretty much the same. But if there happens to be one that's a little bit different, what you may find is that there's a little bit of dialogue going on in the translation community, and this is one of those places, okay? Because this word, this word that they translate as miscarriage, it's the word uh, yetza. And the word yetza, what it means is, in essence, to literally translate it is, so that it comes out. So that it comes out. It's the same word that you would use for motion in terms of going from inside the building to outside the building, from inside your home to outside your home. And so yetza in essence, is saying, if the baby is born prematurely, if the baby is born prematurely, let me read what it says in the NIV translation so you can hear it. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, it's referring to the baby. The offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and on. In essence, what, it, what it's saying in Exodus is, listen, if this mother gives birth prematurely, and let's say that the baby was, you know, seven, eight months along, and dad has to take off a little bit of work, for a few weeks, take care of mom, take care of baby, and, and nurse, and take care of, of this baby. Nurse them back to health. Anything that it cost them, 
this dude who is doing Fight Club needs to pay for that. But if the baby is injured or even dies, eye for eye, a tooth for a tooth, life for life. Now, we are not under the law. We are under grace, okay? So uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we go out and go eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and stuff like that. We'll let the courts deal with all that stuff. Um, but here's the thing. It makes it very clear here when life begins. According to the book of Exodus, as we look at this, life begins at conception. Life begins at conception, and God has plans before we even do. We don't know what they are, but I gave a few different options or a few different um, moments when we look at people's lives and, and how difficult these, these conversations can be. And the first one, you know, I talked about a mom who is pregnant with five kids, and this person is actually a friend of mine. Um, Carrie and, and Gavin Jones. Carrie and Gavin tell, told me a story that goes something like this. They got together after a, early on in the pregnancy, and one of the doctors strongly recommended, I want to get the language correct here, strongly recommended, as he put, selectively reduce. We highly encourage you to selectively reduce. Uh, and they said, that's not an option. And the doctor, you know, was, was kind of like, listen, I, I just, like, I really do care, and, and I, if I could probe a little bit more into this question, wh- why? why? Why is it not an option? And Carrie, who has medical degrees, is a physician's assistant, and I quote, she said, because it's murder. And that sounds like very strong language, doesn't it? But that is the same language that you will find from church fathers from the second century as well. And it's interesting because, let me show you the pictures here. This is Will, David, Marcy, Seth, and Grace. And actually, that, that, that tall dude over there on the left, that's Isaac. That's their, that's their firstborn son. Um, but within this, Gavin and Carrie, they've imagined and they've gone, how could I pick one of my kids? I can't imagine a life without one of them. They were all born. They all were, their parents chose for them to be born. Another situation that we find is, what if, what if I find out that something's not going right? What if something's not going right in my baby's life? What if there's a, a quote-unquote, a birth defect or, or, or a disease or something going on? And, and this is the story of a little girl, a little girl named Sela Briella, Ryan and Darcy. Apple. Um, these are friends from, from my home church that ordained me, um, Delta Community Christian Church in Lansing, Michigan. Um, I remember hearing this story many, many years ago. And, you know, Ryan and Darcy, they found out very early on to the pregnancy that something wasn't going right. In fact, they found out that their baby, at 20 weeks, they found out that this baby had Potter's Syndrome. And Potter's syndrome is 99% fatal. The baby had only one kidney, and the other kidney was barely functioning to the place where they were told, listen, this baby will not survive long outside of the womb. And nobody would judge you if you were to end this pregnancy. And they decided, God has given life, and we're going to do this. Okay. They decided, they prayed about it, they talked about it. I don't know what all that conversation was like, and I'm sure there were a lot of emotions. But ultimately, they decided to have this baby. And as time went on, as time went on, they found out that the doctor said, listen, we may be able to prolong your baby's life a little bit longer, maybe a few months. But they also found it may be very painful for the baby. And in the midst of all of this, that church was going on a retreat that they do every single year together. And nobody would have thought anything less of them for not going. They had a lot going on, but they decided, we want to go. And while the church did not tell them what to do, they prayed with them. They talked with them. I'm certain that there were tears in there as well on both sides. And in the midst of it, Ryan and Darcy came to a decision for themselves as they tried to discern what was God's will. 
And what would they do with that? And as they did, they came to the decision that they were not going to try to prolong the baby's life because it would be painful, but they were going to continue to have this baby. In fact, they had a name, Selah, Briella. And Selah, it's this Hebrew word that simply means to pause or rest. There's a little bit of ambiguity of what it means, but you'll see it in the Psalms very often, and it's to pause or to rest. And the second part of her name, Briella, it comes from the name Gabriella, and that means uh, one, uh, mighty one of God or strength of God. And so when you pair them together, the meaning of her name, of Selah, Briella's name, is resting in God's strength. Isn't that a beautiful name? Isn't that a beautiful place to be? But as they rested, and she rested, and, and she heard mom and dad in the womb, as, they, as, as she heard the, the, the voice of siblings and the music they were making on the piano and everything else, maybe, they heard a little, maybe she heard a little bit of sibling rivalry and she's like, oh yeah, it's on. I don't know, but I know Darcy felt that life growing in her womb. At eight months and two weeks, she was born into this world. Let me show you some pictures. Isn't she cute? Selah, Briella, was born into this world. And she lived for eight months, two weeks, and three hours. For three hours, their family and their friends, their church, they held and cradled and loved. But the love did not begin at the beginning of life outside the womb. It began at the beginning of life inside the womb. There was something going on even before they knew about this. And let me tell you, every year it's amazing. This happened a number of years ago, but here's the thing. Darcy and Ryan share. They share that every year when they go graveside, about 30 people show up to celebrate Selah's life every single year. And telling this story even continues to celebrate her life. In fact, let me tell you, um, we've put her whole story online, okay? This is, and, and I've gotten permission from the Apple family um, to do this. But this, if you look this up, if you go to um, uh, arundelcc.org forward slash Selah's hyphen story, you will hear the whole story. And here's the thing. I'm just going to let you guys know. When you sit down to read this, and I encourage you to do so, grab some tissue. I'm not exaggerating. Um, you know, it's going to be one of those moments, dudes, where you're like, I'm not crying, you're crying. Because I'll tell you what, I've, I had tears over this. I shared it with a couple of people on our staff. They had tears. It is a beautiful and amazing story of not just the Apples family, but of God's love for them and for Selah. Sto Selah's story is one to be heard. But here's the thing. Again, there's a third story that oftentimes comes about. And it's that story, that question of, well, what about the 18-year-old who's afraid? And I think of a friend. I think of a friend who was 18 years old. And she was pregnant. She was not married. She was afraid. Her mom was afraid. Or, and in the midst of it, they did go to a clinic. And while she did not want to have an abortion, she decided to end the life of that child. The mom encouraged it. And let me tell you, she, she went from fear to shame to struggle. But the beautiful thing is, eventually she went to forgiveness and compassion. She went to forgiveness and passion because here's the thing. The third thing that brings value. Value is determined by cost. What did it cost? Let me read out of 1 Corinthians. Now, there's a, there's a whole thing going on here. I know that it's not talking directly about abortion, but it is talking about the body. And it's speaking to believers. And it says this. Paul says, an early follower of Jesus, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We were bought by a price. And that price was God's own son, Jesus, who died on the cross 
for our sins. For anyone who would call upon his name, there is forgiveness. And you'll notice, I didn't mention my friend's name. You know why? Because this is not the unpardonable sin. We all have our own sins. We all have our own sins. We all fall short of the glory of God. Maybe that's not your sin, but maybe it is. And I want you to know, though, that there's also hope. I love, I love that God loves us no matter what we've done. He sent his son before we got it right. I love also that God never, ever wastes a hurt. Hear this out of 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. He wants us to take that comfort and give it to others. But here's the thing. We've got to understand that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We've got to take, we've got to take our sins and not have them as our own. But here's the thing. It says in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. My friend, while she may have had an abortion and ended the life of that child, perfectly formed, she found forgiveness in Jesus. And after she found forgiveness in Jesus, she eventually found herself serving others. She found herself actually going to a pregnancy clinic and coming alongside other women who were struggling, other people who were struggling with what do I do and coming alongside others and making, making a mark in this world for the kingdom of God. Because at the end of the day, one tragic situation shouldn't necessitate another. There was forgiveness. And, and here's the thing. In the midst of all this, I want to give a resource that, listen, it's called Surrendering the Secret, Healing the Heartbreak of Abortion. If you have had an abortion, or you know someone who has, and you're struggling through that, listen, write your name, grab a Connect card, write your name on there, say, hey, I want that book. We will send that to you. And if you're interested in even leading one of those, we'd love to know that, because we would love to come alongside those who are struggling even today. But there's three things to consider. In the midst of everything that's going on, I want to give you three things really quickly. No one thinks clearly when emotions are high. So if you're talking with your friend, understand emotions may be high in the midst of this conversation. The second thing is everyone is trying to do what they think or feel is right. Both sides are trying to do what they feel is right. But that doesn't necessarily make it righteous. But we need to first and foremost understand that somebody who doesn't agree with us is not our enemy. Because that leads into the third, the third thing to consider. God's standard is the only standard that matters in this world. And so each week we do this thing called what now, God? In the midst of what now, God? We ask, what do I do with this? Well, for some of you, maybe you've gone through an abortion. Maybe you have even performed one or come alongside someone in doing all of this. You need to experience forgiveness. And whether you have gone through that or not, listen, we all need to experience forgiveness because we've all fallen short of the glory of God in one way, shape, or form. The second thing to do is educate yourself. I think so often I have conversations with people who say that they are pro-life or pro-choice or whatever in between. And so often, the only way that they've ever educated themselves is by looking at social media. Well, if it's on social media, it must be true, right? I think that we need to go a little bit deeper. I think that it's important that we read, and, and not just read, but w read what, what we think, but what God thinks in his word. We need to learn to walk through this and other issues with others in a way that is life-giving, and that, that leads into our third what now, and that is actions speak louder than social media pour into others. It may be pouring into them by giving grace 
It may be coming alongside them as they're trying to make those decisions and doing it with not just truth, but with grace. And make certain that that's balanced. It may be that somebody decided, you know what, I'm going to have that baby and it is going to be a struggle. Come alongside them. Buy them some diapers. Go even further than that. Maybe serve up in Kid Point. Do Kid Venture. Because guess what? Somebody's going to have to come alongside these kids and these families. It is hard to raise children in, as a couple. It's even more difficult when you're a single and when you're starting out especially. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you asking for your grace in time of need. And we always need it. We all need it. God, we ask that you would help us to affirm life as you have and making us in your image from the beginning, right in the DNA. We ask that you would reveal yourself to us more today and tomorrow than the next day until we see you face to face. We ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.